John 14 and verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So this is around the same time as we've been talking about on John 16, of course. This is John 14, just two chapters earlier. And Judas has just left the supper to go to betray Jesus and to hand him over to the Pharisees. And so Jesus is like, well, this is it. So he is telling his disciples that he's going away. Same, you know, this is the same passage areas that we are seeing with the helper. You know, he's saying, I'm going away and sending the helper. But here, this is, this is before then. And he's telling them that he's going and he's going to prepare a place for us, okay, in his father's house. So, who is Jesus' father? God. Where is his father's house? In heaven. So, Jesus is telling his disciples and us, because we are also his disciples, <laughs> That he is going to prepare, there is going to be mansions there, and he's going to prepare them for us in heaven. Okay, these are real mansions. This is not like a, it's not like some mystical mansion of, you know, something from Doctor Strange or whatever. This is an actual real mansion. It's in heaven because heaven is an actual place. It's not a mystical state of being. It is not something referring to something else. It is not poetic language. Heaven is a real place, and if you think of it, sometimes you can think of it like a planet, another planet. Um, that's actually um, the distance between here and heaven is not a physical distance. Okay? It's a spiritual distance. It's not physical. So you say, well, where is heaven? It's close to here. Not physically, though. Because we only measure things with physical distances because of the five senses. But in the spiritual world, you don't measure things with the five senses. You measure them with spiritual things. So heaven is not far from here. Our friends and family that have gone before us are in heaven, and it's not far from here. And they can see us from there. Okay? Sometimes as you move in the spirit, you can see them over there. Okay? You can see back and forth. As we get closer to the return of Jesus, these two realms are getting closer together, and the veil that separates them is getting thinner and thinner. And so as we get closer to the return, or this next age, we call the millennial age, and we end this age, which is the age of grace, the church age, heavenly things are going to become more visible in this realm, okay? So that's because they're real. They're not poetic words, so Jesus is going to prepare these mansions in heaven, and we will all live there. That's where we're going to go to live. That's where our houses will be. We have houses here, and God blesses us with wonderful places to live and all of this, and that's great because that's part of the blood. And it's a type of heaven, right? Heaven is not a type of here. This is a type of heaven. These good things are, are things that we'll see in heaven. Houses. We'll see houses in heaven because that's where we will be. This is so short. This is so, that's like, Little sliver, then eternity. Eternity, we have houses. We'll be in those houses, and Jesus is preparing them for us. He's really good. Really, really good. I mean, think about that. I mean, he's preparing everybody's house for them, like everyone's. <laughs> it's awesome. Heaven, as we are taught religiously, that heaven is kind of like a country club. When you get to heaven, you retire for eternity. There's a gate. Yeah, there's a gate. It's a gate of community. Uh, and, and, instead, and, the, and the actual person that lets you in is, is St. Peter. All of that is not in the Bible. None of that is in the Bible at all. Um, there, is, there are gates into heaven, but there's not St. Peter at the gate. That's not how it works. As a matter of fact, we read in the scripture that the gates stay open night and day. They don't ever close. So there's, not a, there's a gate, yes, but you just walk into it. You do know that when we leave this body, um, from what we found, mostly your escort with your angel, you and your angel will go to heaven. He'll you know, help you get, you'll get up there. Um, people will 
um, from time to time, and, they, and there are realms in the spirit people go where they actually travel to heaven while they're still here on earth. They don't die. They're not dead. They just left their body, went to heaven, and came back. It happens too. But heaven is a place where people do things. Think about this. What do angels do? They worship. They come and deliver messages. They save people, right? They do lots of different things. They travel all around, and they do things, and they come from the presence of the Lord, and they do things. You know, they hang out with us, <laughs> our angels do, all the time. And, um, you know, can you imagine, like, hanging out with, you know, you guys hanging out with each other, and you're just standing there the whole time, and you never, you know, interact. There's no interaction or anything like that. And I'm not saying that we're supposed to, like, sit there and converse with our angels, but we should at least honor their presence and honor that they're there and be aware of them. And they are, they've been with us our whole life, you know, so it's not like there's something that they don't know about us. They know, but, they, but that's what I'm saying. Like the love of God covers us. The love of God cleanses us. We don't have to feel ashamed in front of God. We don't have to feel uh, embarrassed in front of him because his love covers us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And we can be in his presence without any sense of guilt or shame. We're children of God now. So these angels, and, you know, without getting into too much teaching along this line, do things. So when we go to heaven, it's not country club time. It's not like I finally get to retire forever. <laughs> we'll have jobs to do, fun jobs. Maybe we'll go to some place in the universe somewhere and take care of some intergalactic something that needed to be taken care of. We'll interact. I mean, think about all the people we can talk to. Think about all the, you know, you can go talk to Abraham. You can go talk to different people. You can talk to the angels. You can see how some of these things were done. We don't know how they're done. I mean, we know how they're done in the natural some things, but we don't know how they were actually done. Because what what, how these creation was done was in the spiritual realm. So we can see these things. So it'll be fun, you know. Um, so just remember that. And here's the other thing about it. Um, we, won't tra- we won't have to travel in vehicles. We won't need vehicles. We can just go. We're there. Like Australia, boom, back. Australia, back. Australia, back. Australia, back. I mean, that's it. It's so, so it's not a. So that's not going to be a big part of our life is figuring out how to get from here to there. So we'll have other priorities, right? We'll have other things that will be um, more important than figuring out how to eat and figuring out how to travel and things because we won't need to eat if we don't want to. Well, we could eat because we'll be in heaven, you know. So so there's other things God will give us, and um, what God is going to have us do in heaven, he's starting here. So what we're doing here is, is the beginning stages of what we will always do. That's why it's important to know what God's plan is for you now. Because like, I need to know what God's plan is for my life, so I do it while I'm alive. Yeah, but see, God's plan for your life doesn't stop here. That's why it's so important to do it right, because... You know, and that just means submitting yourself and humbling yourself to God. Because we say, well, what if I do all these things here on the earth, and I decided to do them, and now I go to heaven, they're like, well, I guess we're going to start over because you were supposed to do these things. You know what I'm saying? It's not because, you know, we want everyone to say, well, God wants you to live your best life today here on the earth, right? Okay, that's true. He does. But he also wants you to live your life from heaven. Not to heaven, from heaven. Does that make sense? So let's say that we're a Christian on the earth working our way to heaven. No. We're a Christian in heaven doing heavenly things on the earth. It's a different concept. That's how Jesus does it. It's totally the opposite. So religion tells us you started here on earth, you're on earth, you're working hard, and you're going to work your way up to your heavenly place. And Jesus is saying you're seated in heavenly places in Christ, work from here on earth as you are in heaven. This is the message of the Spirit for the church right now, is that this type of false doctrine (laughs) that we've been taught and it's been taught through the, through the centuries, needs to stop. We need to stop, stop teaching people temporary things. 
carnal, temporary, fleshy things and begin to teach from the realm of heaven where we are. We are in heaven. Whether we decide to ever exercise any of our abilities, I could find out that I was related to the king of England. Let's say I find out next week that I was related to the kingdom. Have I done anything about that my entire life? No, because I didn't even know about it. But guess what happens when I find out? Now I have all sorts of authority and all sorts of riches and all sorts of things that I can exercise. This is what the Spirit tells us. He says to us, I want you to understand you are royalty. You are the children of God. You are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Now begin to work out of that position. Don't work from down here up. Work from up there as it is down here. Okay? So when we're thinking about going to heaven, realize that we already are in heaven and that following God's plan for our life here on the earth has to do with here and there simultaneously. What we want is a smooth transition right from here to there. You begin to, so this is why spiritual things need to become more real to us because when you talk about prayer, People think, oh, yeah, that's the thing that you do. But you talk about going out and, and, and feeding a bunch of people. That, oh, that's really good. Well, you got to be able to see the, the, what is good about each of these things. You know what I'm saying? Like um, numbers, money, things like that. Those are high priorities on the earth. But, but those are just tools in heaven. They're not actually the thing. The thing is the people. It's always the people. So... Keep that in mind with your perspective of heaven. You're already seated in heavenly places in Christ. You're already from heaven. You are just walking here on the earth because God needs us here to bring the rest of it in line. Not just the people, but the places, everything about this earth. He didn't give up on the earth. People think, oh, God gave up on the earth, and then it's going to get nuked in the tribulation. Jesus will come back for a thousand years. No, no, no. That is not how it works. This is God's planet. He owns it. Just because Satan ruled here doesn't mean that God has washed his hands of earth and said, ah, forget it. <laughs> he screwed it up. No, he wants us to be his representatives here on the earth and bring this earth in line with heaven. And they say, oh, that sounds like a kingdom now philosophy. Yes, it is. It's a kingdom now. The kingdom of heaven is now. That's what Jesus said. The kingdom of heaven is here. It's not coming in the future. It's here now. So as we begin to develop in the knowledge of this, we can begin to have more of a heavenly perspective on our lives. How long does it take? Like I was saying the other day, how much money is one soul? Is it $5,000? What if you can spend $100 per soul? It doesn't work like that. Souls are invaluable. There is no, there's not enough stuff on the planet. You could take the whole planet Earth, stick it in God's hand, and say, is this enough for one soul? And you'd say no. <laughs> so that's why we had Jesus. Jesus' blood is more precious than the Earth. It's more precious than anything. So, um, so anyway, so this is heaven. So John 14, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So Jesus is going away. He says, but he's coming back so that we can be there with him. So, well, he, he came back from the grave, right? Because he hadn't been crucified yet. So he did come back to them shortly after, right? So it could mean the second coming of Jesus. It could mean when he returns the second time, like we haven't seen him return the second. But it could also mean the resurrection a few days later. Because what I just say, when we're born of the Spirit, we come into the kingdom of God, we become a part of the kingdom of heaven, and then we find out that we're seated in heavenly places, we exist now in heaven. You know, you know what I'm saying? We're here on the earth in this body, but we're also in heaven at the same time. So Jesus is saying we're, that where I go, you can go also. So one way to put it is, when you're born of the Spirit and born again, we're now with Jesus. Now we're with Jesus in heaven. So how can you be in heaven and on earth at the same time? Well, Jesus talks about that. Even if you read in, uh, in John 3, where he talked about uh, being in heaven and here on the earth at the same time. So we our citizenship of, is of there. So that's what I'm saying. Where you could also take it to mean that. 
Now and then verse 4, he says this, And where I go, you know, in the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, good old Thomas, Lord, we do not know <laughs> where you are going, and how can we know the way? <laughs> this is the pre-born again Thomas, but anyway. So Jesus didn't have to say this last part, did he? He didn't, have to, he didn't have to leave it at that. He didn't have to say, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. Say, Jesus, why? Why would you say it like that? Why don't you just say, the way you know is this, and, and, and how, you know, where I'm going, you know, and it's this, and how I go, and, and the way you know is this. Like, why didn't he just tell him? Why did he have to, why did he have to say it like this? Do you ever wonder things like that? You know, God, why are you... Why are you saying it like this? I'll tell you one of the reasons why God says certain things like that. Because it's precious, there's precious things that you need to want. <laughs> and there are certain things that he says, and it's a form of an invitation for more. Yeah. Remember, there's levels in heaven. Yeah. Okay, there are levels of heaven. You know, there's different areas that you can go to. There were levels in the temple going in through the tabernacle. Certain people are content to be in a certain spot. And Jesus says a question with an unknown aspect on it. And that unknown aspect is your invitation to come in so he can answer more for you. Okay? So this is one of the reasons why. So remember that sometimes when you hear something from God, like maybe you have a dream. Sometimes there's dreams that people will have where at the end there's a question. Like, huh, my thing that I've been doing is if there's a question, ask God for the rest of it because he's giving you a little bit to pique your interest. He likes having fun. It's, a, it's not a game because it's a real thing, but it's fun for him. So he says this kind of stuff. So where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas is like, I don't know what you're talking about. So Jesus didn't have to say the last part. Now, some people would think he would say, if he'd said anything, he'd say, where I go, you don't know, and the way you don't know. So don't ask me, because <laughs> I'm Jesus and you're not. But he didn't say that. That's what men do with God. They try to lock him away where you can't get to him. They do. Religious people, they lock him away. So they could say something, well, that's exclusive knowledge only the truly enlightened get. You know, in some religions, that's the way it is. This is exclusive. This is, you know, maybe when you reach our level of growth, we will tell you about that, okay? Or they say things, well, this is for later on. Or this is something that happened a long time ago in the past, and you can't know this. But Jesus doesn't say that. He told his disciples, in essence, where I'm going, you can follow me there. Because you know where I'm going and you know how to get there. He was telling them, you can follow me. You, I, where I'm going, you know, and how you get there, you know how to do it. So he's letting them know it's an invitation. An invitation is not something that you can't get to, right? If you invite somebody, come on over to my house. Well, where is it? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> That's not a good invitation, right? When you get an invitation in the car, in the mail, it usually has an address on it, right? Or at least a phone number. So if Jesus is giving you an invitation, he's going to give you an address at least so you can get there so you can see what's there. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he answers his question right there. He spells it out. How do you get to the Father's house? Through Jesus. That's the only way to the Father's house is through Jesus. So Jesus went to heaven so we can go to heaven through him. So, and like I said before, we need to stop seeing heaven as a destination. We get to when we die. Heaven is not available just only then. I don't know why it has so ingrained in religious teaching that heaven is just a faraway place that you get to one day. It's almost like the seven cities of gold or like, you know, like uh, Atlantis. It's like one day you'll get to Atlantis, but now you can't get to Atlantis. It's like, where did that come from and why is that so prevalent? It's like, oh, they just died. They went to heaven. That's good. Finally, someone went to heaven. And it'd be like, well, why can't you experience heaven on the earth? 
If Jesus said the way that you go, you get to heaven through him. But then someone said you get to heaven through him and the spirit of death. Did they not? Is that not what is taught? You get to heaven through Jesus and the gate of death. Did Jesus say anything in here that the way was him and the gate of death? It does not say that anywhere in the Bible because it's not scriptural and it's not the way heaven is. Heaven is not a gate that you go through when you go through death. Heaven is here. Like I said, heaven is a distance away from here, a short distance, but not a physical one. And so heaven's entry, you know the evil spirits can see heaven. Of course they can. Do you think they have access to the throne like we would have access to the throne? No, they do not. But they all know where it is. They all, I mean, for goodness sake, that's where they all came from. Right? So it's not like a big mystery, a faraway land of, of the seven cities of gold or Atlantis. It's heaven. It's a place. It's like, how do you get to New York City? Well, everyone knows where New York City is. Right? Well, how do you get to the city of God? Well, Jesus answered it right there through him. That's the only way you can get there. Because every other way is not a way to God at all. It's a way to, we'll read here, destruction. So, options. Okay? Think about this for a second. Options. We have a lot of options. Okay? Our modern society in America, now you go to Africa, it's a little different. There's not as many options. But options are a sign of our prosperity. We have many, many options. And with the internet and digital things, we have even more options because there were options we didn't even know about. And now we have those options. As a matter of fact, there's some options. People are retiring to these like countries out in the middle of Africa somewhere because the cost of living is so low and they live like kings out there. People from America. Did you ever see any of those? So those, those kind of options are now available. You, how would you even have known about that before the internet? So we have all these options. And sometimes we have so many options that it overwhelms us and we have to hire somebody to help us make a decision based on all these options, like what you guys do. <laughs> real estate, you know, real estate agents and brokers are here to help us with all the options, all of the things out there and helping us make a decision on what the best course of action is based on all these options. And it's a prosperous thing. And I'm not saying in any way that this is bad. It's good. It's a sign of prosperity, right? Once you have enough money, you will want to hire an investment um, broker who can go through your, your money and make some decisions for you financially so that you pick the right options so that you can retire comfortably, right? That's the kind of thing, that's how our world works, because of these options, okay? But here's what happens, and you'll see this mainly with younger people. They take this options concept and they bring it into the spiritual realm. And you'll hear people, especially in, the, in this over the past 10 years, 10, 15 years, telling you that there are many ways to God, that there are many ways, and that for you to say that there's only one way to God means you're closed-minded. Right. You're not open-minded, you're closed. You're, you're kind of living in a relic of the past, and that's unfortunate because we're modern now and we have options, okay? Now, yes, we do have options in the natural, but we're talking about spiritual things, and like I said before, spiritual things are actually real. <laughs> They're not just what you think it is. So, and then they might say even this, how can you hate people that don't think like you do? So anytime somebody doesn't think like you, like you do, you immediately say, well, you hate me because you don't think like me. It's like, it's a very immature way of seeing things, but we see a lot of it now. And I think what we have is, is a group of, of influential people who know better, who feed into that immature behavior. That's pretty much what we see. That's what all the riots are. It's people who know better who are feeding into immature behavior and kind of, yeah, okay, well, yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah, they, don't, they hate you, you know, but they know better. They know that's not true. And instead of correcting the younger generation, they just um, basically instigate it because they're looking for some instability. Those, those, now, I will tell you, we're, we're going to see more of that for a little while, but I do believe that there is a move of the spirit happening in the country, and we will still see less of it, but there will probably be 
more of it first. <laughs> then there'll be less of it. Because people are beginning to see things, and God is beginning to move in, in areas. Christians are beginning to recognize their heavenly place and pray. Um, that's making a big difference. So this is not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, he, what he's saying is, is you actually don't have any options to the Father except the one way. <laughs> it's not that he's trying to hate all the other options or that he doesn't like you or whatever. It's, he's just, he's bringing light. He's just bringing light. He's just saying, look, I'm letting you know there was no way to the Father at one point, and now there's one. It's me, right? He says, no man comes to the Father but by me. We'll say Jesus here, me. <laughs> but we're Jesus here on this earth, right? So by, by him and by faith in him. So believing on Jesus is believing in the way because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It is not believing in a way. Jesus is not a way to the Father. Jesus is the way to the Father. And I have, I have had conversations with people that came to church and decided to become a Christian because they analyzed the other religions and they came to the conclusion that Jesus was the best decision as an option for God to worship. And they just thought the others weren't as good of a decision. These are fairly intellectual people. <laughs> but you'll find that, because the young generation is all intellectually uh, educated in the universities. And so the decisions that they make are based on intellectual analysis. And then they make a decision based on that. These are your investment brokers and your <laughs> real estate agents and different people. These are the people that are making decisions for their own life. And so. They go through and they make a decision. They look at all of the different religions, have some check boxes and maybe a graph and a little thing and can do this. And, and then sometimes, you know, they look to see which belief system lines up with their lifestyle, okay? Because they, they have a lifestyle they're using and they realize that to be a well-rounded person on the earth, you need a religious side. Okay. Now, some people have decided that they do not need a religious side, and so they picked the religious side that is, I don't have a religious side, which is also a religious side, but they don't admit to that, but that's okay, because you can't pull that out. Faith is a part of everybody. So I thought about this. Tibetan monks, you know, they're nice guys, right? They don't bother anybody, as far as I can tell, right? They're peaceful. They're helping people out. They stick to themselves. They meditate, do stuff that's nice. They help nature. Yeah, sounds nice, right? Why not take that religion for a spin? You know, Tibetan monks. And you'll see these young people, and they'll take these trips to Indonesia or wherever, China somewhere, and they'll check out the Tibetan monks for a while. See, you know. Wonder how these Tibetan monks, yeah, maybe we'll just try that. Well, there's some stuff. Maybe I'll mix, maybe we'll mix and match a little bit. We'll take the Tibetan monk style of this and this and that. And so they put together kind of a mix and match style. I did that the other day with my airline tickets. You can mix and match different airlines. You get a better price. So they're mixing and matching their beliefs. So they get the right price, you know? How much is this costing me? Not much. And you know what? I can pretty much be religious and still kind of keep things rolling, right? And if anybody asks me what you believe, I can say, well, I believe this, this, and this. You see that? And they all match up, and I can keep doing what I'm doing. So stop bothering me. So these are great. And if whatever you think is just true, then that would be a great way to do it. Because whatever you think is true is true. But the problem with that <laughs> is that in reality, that's not how it is. And if you're in the dark, you can put together whatever mess you want <laughs> and call it whatever you want <laughs> because you can't see it. <laughs> And that's what people do when they do this. They're in the dark. They're picking things up around that they can't see, putting them together, and telling everybody, you know, it's a bicycle. <laughs> it's like, it's not a bicycle, man. <laughs> you know, because it's the dark. Because so, Jesus is not just the door. He's also the light of the world. And we're the light of the world. So what we do is we get up, and we stand up on top of the mountain, and we shine the light in all the valleys. 
and we say, look, 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 this is the light. The true light is Jesus. He is the only way to the Father. There is no other way to the Father. Tibetan monks are nice guys. I'm sure they're going to make great Christians if they'll come to Jesus. Everyone needs to come to Jesus because he is the way. So no matter what I think is the way, there is a real and there is a false. And there's a lot of false. <laughs> so Jesus isn't discriminating against other people in religion. He's just shining light. Light shining in darkness. So if we're going to follow Jesus, we need to hear the words that Jesus spoke. Some people say, I follow Jesus, and they don't actually have ever heard. They actually haven't heard anything that Jesus spoke except for maybe a piece here and a piece there because maybe they went to church when they were little. They don't know what Jesus said. So in Mark, Matthew 7, verse 13. Oh, this is my favorite one right here. All right. Will you guys stick with me a little bit so I can just do this part because this, I really like this. All right. Matthew 7, 13. It says, Enter, enter by the narrow gate, okay? For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are a few who find it. So in the spiritual realm, on this planet, when it comes to God, there are many options. To, there are many paths that you can take. But the scripture calls all of these paths together as the Broadway. Not like Broadway in New York, but <laughs> could be, depending on the play you're watching. Um, <laughs> so there is a Broadway and there is a narrow way. And so Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. So who is the narrow gate? Jesus is the narrow gate. He is the way the way to heaven. And then if you'll notice, it says, many go in by the broad way. And sometimes we like to think that there is strength in numbers. You know, they have this thing called crowdsourcing. It's a concept they use in software, and I think they use it in other areas. And it basically means if you get enough people, you'll get the facts right. Nope. <laughs> it works in some things, but it definitely doesn't work in spiritual things because you have to determine whether the crowd is in the dark or in the light. If the whole crowd is in the dark, they can come up with a million things, and you may find some type of pattern, but the pattern is all in the dark. So even logically speaking, a crowdsourced religious conclusion, you have to evaluate where the crowd is. If the crowd is in the dark, the conclusion will be wrong. Yep, it's always going to be a dark conclusion. So, I mean, any type of statistical analysis, and people do this. You know, they have this thing online where people ask, like, really intellectual questions and try to get intellectual answers and all this business. And it just, it's just a lot of dark, you know, because they don't look at the light. They don't acknowledge the light. If you can't acknowledge light, you'll just stay in darkness, right? It's like you're in darkness. There's light over here. And you're like, I'm making some decisions here in the dark. And they're like, you know, you're not saying that. You're like, I'm making some decisions here in my light, which is no light <laughs> without Jesus. I'm making decisions out of the light that I've created. And you're like, fine. Be like, but there's a light over here. I do not acknowledge that light. Do not acknowledge that light. I only acknowledge my light. And you make the decision to only acknowledge your light, you're in darkness. And you'll stay in darkness until you repent. <laughs> That's why Jesus said repent first. You have to repent first to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have to repent of what? Of your way. What you were believing, what you believed about God was wrong. What you believed about God, about there being many ways to God, was wrong. You have to acknowledge that first before you can accept the light of Jesus being the way to God. Many, many people will not make that decision. They want to do it their way. They want to find a religion that fits their lifestyle options. They're not concerned with the truth. Okay? So, this is sad. I'm not done yet. <laughs> it's not all sad. It'll be good. So, there is not strength in numbers when it comes to the spirit because if you're in the dark, the strength is weakness. And you'll have a lot more weakness than you had before. Yeah. You get a lot of weak together, you've multiplied weakness. Yeah. <clears throat> John 10. <laughs> I 
Are you going to preach this one? <laughs> John 10, 1. I started really late, you guys, so if you fall asleep, we'll just have Elena come and shake you. We'll get you some coffee. Okay. So most assuredly, man, if Jesus says most assuredly, you better listen to what he has to say. <laughs> he wants to make sure you know this is how it is. <laughs> most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Okay. So you, there's, there's a bunch here, so we're just going to have to bear with us here. But. So this is an interesting parable, because what you'll know about this parable, if you've heard it before, is Jesus is both the shepherd and the door. <laughs> he's the good shepherd, but he's also the door into the sheepfold. He's both. The other thing that we're going to see here you can see it right from the beginning because you have thieves and a robber. That tells you something. That tells you that there's something of value inside the sheepfold. What's valuable in the sheepfold? The sheep. The sheep are valuable. They're the most valuable. So are people valuable? Turn to 1 John 3. I don't, I still... <laughs> Because it's hard to see on the earth. You have to have revelation. It's hard to see the value that we have in the spiritual realm, in, in, in creation. It's hard sometimes to see because we look at ourselves and we're like, really? Me? <laughs> Me? I'm the one that's valuable? Really? But look at 1 John 3 in verse 1. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. That's powerful right there. What manner, what kind of love is this? That he took somebody that was in the condition that we were in and not only restored us, but made us a child of his. This is, a very, this is amazing. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Now, what's the world? The world is just anyone who doesn't believe in Jesus. We were in the world before we believed in Jesus. It's just a spiritual place. World or heaven. World, light or dark. Beloved, now we are children of God. When are we children of God? When we get to heaven? We are children of God now. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. There is a metamorphosis, a transformation that is taking place within every one of us. It is continual. It has started from the time we were born again, and it continues on into eternity, and it's a transformation into light. It's a transformation into glorification of the children of God. Because you can see here, it does not yet appear what we shall be. In other words, where we are now and where we're going out through eternity is going to be different. It's not going to be like this, but it started now. It's starting right now. The fact that we even know that is an indication that it has already started. The fact that you know that you are a child of God and that what we are now is not what we will be. The fact that we know that is proof that that is the case. Because how could we possibly know that unless God revealed that to us by the Spirit? See, spiritual revelation is very powerful. Because once the thing becomes revealed, it becomes alive. Right? When Jesus was your Savior, he became alive in you. Before the knowledge of Jesus, not alive in you. Because you didn't know. Because the Spirit of God reveals. And when he reveals, the Bible says he quickens. He quickens the word. He makes it alive to us. So for us to know that we are not just human, but we are now the children of God, and what we will be, we do not even know yet, because as he is, so we will be. When he is revealed, there will be another transformation that takes place physically. And we can have physical transformations here too. We can have, we can have times in the spirit where, where things get transformed within us as well. Physically. What do you think healing is? Physical transformation by the Spirit of God. 
And we know that too. <laughs> we know about healing because of the Spirit of God. So we look at ourselves in the mirror. There's a big mirror here. I look at myself. There I am. That's just the tent I'm in. That's not me. I'm inside of here. <laughs> I'm inside of this body. Now I should take care of this body. This body is like the, this is the temple of the Holy Spirit, you know. But that's not all I am. So we're being transformed every day into the image of Jesus. There are waves, okay? There are waves of glory, the glory of God, waves of his glory that are yet to come. Have you ever experienced a wave of the presence of God, a wave of his glory? I've been in meetings, and the wave, the wave of the Spirit will begin to flow across the meeting, and, and people will begin to fall. Just like that. And you could, and you could feel it. You didn't even have to look, and you can feel it when the power just went, and down you go, because there's a wave of the glory of God physically. You could feel it in your body. There are waves of the Spirit of God we can experience even without being in a big meeting. We'd be in just with us and the Lord, and the Holy Spirit would just come upon us and quicken us. Quicken us. You may feel sickness on your body, and all of a sudden the Spirit of God comes upon you and quickens you. And now you feel better. Or you're tired. You've worked all day. And you come and you lift your hands, and you receive, and the Holy Spirit quickens your body. And now you have strength that you didn't have before. Because we're quickened by the Spirit of God. Okay? So these waves of glory come and they transform us into his image. Revelation comes to us. It transforms our mind. And then our, our spirit begins to follow into the thing that we've been, that's been revealed by the spirit. Okay? So Satan knows that the sheep are valuable to God. He doesn't like God. <laughs> and thus, he doesn't like us. But he's not going to go through the gate, right? He's a thief and a robber. And Jesus already called him out on it. You're a thief and a robber. You're not going to ever go through the gate. He's already been judged. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. He isn't in a place of, of authority. He's not in heaven. He's fallen. Right? We're not fallen. We're the glorified ones. We're, we're in heaven. So what does he do? He goes over on the side, right? And what do thieves and robbers try to do? They try to take sheep out of the sheepfold. <laughs> right? Isn't that what a thief does? Take them out. What's the sheepfold? It's the kingdom of God. You meet people sometimes. They were saved. They were living for God. Now they're, what do we call it? Backslidden. Right? They don't serve the Lord anymore. Maybe they were in church for a little while and something happened to them. Something happened to them. wonder what that was. <laughs> the thief. Right? And they're not in the sheepfold. A sheepfold is the place where the shepherd cares for the sheep. And we already know the shepherd is Jesus. It's his family. So when we see the person open the door, we know it's the shepherd. We know it's Jesus. Now John 10, verse 3 says this. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his sheep by name and leads them out. So Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep, and he will speak to us because we are his sheep, right? Mm -hmm. So you think about it like this. I'll ask the question. I already answered it, but <laughs> who are Jesus' sheep? Jesus' sheep are all of us who believe in him, who put our trust in him, believe in him as the anointed son of God who came and gave his life for the sins of the world, and that faith in him has given us eternal life. Those are the sheep. That's what he's talking about. Spiritual things are real. They don't become real because you wish on them. <laughs> okay? Faith doesn't work just because you believe. Faith works because you believe the truth. The world confuses this matter greatly. Faith is not just faith in anything. It's faith in spiritual truth, not a lie. You put faith in a lie, and you will get nothing but destruction. Faith in a lie is not produce anything good. Faith is in the truth, the spiritual truth, okay? John 8, 31, Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth 
shall make you free. So is faith important? Well, yes, because you have to believe. Because what does it say? He said it to the Jews who believed in him. <laughs> so it's not just the truth all by itself. It's like there's the truth, so it's going to set you free. So it doesn't matter what you believe. No, no, no. You believe in him, and then the truth, which is the word of God, sets you free. That's why when we were talking before about the helper, Jesus called him what? The spirit of truth. He only hears those things which, he, which the Father speaks. He only repeats those things because that's the truth. He doesn't repeat, and we need to be careful of this, okay? Don't repeat the lies of the devil. The more you talk about the lies of the devil, the more you make it bigger in your life. It's like, I like this, I'd like to pull this weed out, but let's plant some more weeds. No, 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 pull them all out and throw them away. Don't repeat lies. Let me tell you what so-and-so said last week. It wasn't true at all. Let me tell you about it. And then there you go for 10 minutes, telling somebody something that's not true. Because you've spread something that wasn't true. Why would you do that? So we want to enforce the truth so that people will believe. <laughs> people are going to have a hard time believing you if you never tell the truth. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's just the way it is. If you're known to be one that just tells tall tales, I'll be like, there he goes again, telling another tall tale. You know, you have no credibility in the spiritual realm. You've, you've, just, you've kind of removed your, your credibility. So, back to John 10, verse 4. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. So, think about this. The Voice. Have you ever seen that show on TV? It's like a really popular singing show. and Everybody sings because they're looking for The Voice. It has nothing to do with this, but I just thought it was interesting because it's called The Voice. So... Uh, <laughs> But I want to emphasize the term, the voice. Um, I want to present to you that believing on Jesus as the way, okay, is not so much you figuring out your life and your religion, but it's you hearing the voice of the shepherd. So many times in the world, people get their ducks in a row, their religion's in a graph, they get it in col columns, and they figure it out. But I want to present to you that when you came to Jesus, that's not why you came to him. You came to Jesus because you heard the shepherd, yeah. and you are one of his sheep. And when you heard the shepherd's voice, you followed. That's what coming to Jesus is about. Coming to Jesus is about hearing the voice of your shepherd the good shepherd. What did Jesus say? They won't follow a stranger. Sheep don't follow a stranger. What did Jesus say when he looked out on the mountain and he saw all the people? They look like sheep without a shepherd. The devil's not a shepherd. Okay? All of the things that men create, they're not shepherds. There is one shepherd. The shepherd is Jesus. And people say, well, what's a pastor? A pastor's a shepherd. Okay, a pastor's a shepherd, but a pastor who is a shepherd is Jesus. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, you're not going to see any difference. It's just Jesus. It's not a position. Men like to make positions where they can rule from. They like to make their own kingdoms on the earth. There is just one kingdom as ministers that we are supposed to enforce here. It's the kingdom of heaven, not our own kingdoms. I don't want people to honor me with this and that and the other. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're all together honoring Jesus. What makes me? I, my mouth is used to say something from the Lord. Your mouth can be used to say something from the Lord during the week. We're all the children of God. We follow one shepherd, one voice. Now, if a pastor isn't following the shepherd, he'll lead more sheep astray, won't he? Because he's not following the shepherd. He's not listening to the voice. He's not listening to any voice. That's the reason why Jesus said that when he saw those sheep, they were like sheep without a shepherd. That's because the other voices, which are demonic voices, mind you, they get scared when they hear those voices. Do you ever hear one of them talk? They're scary sounding. You're like, what in the world? <laughs> They're scary. Sheep don't follow those kind of voices. They don't. 
say, well, I think a lot of people do. No, they're not following those voices. They are without a shepherd. They're not following anything. <laughs> That's why they're all running around in a circle. And thieves are coming in and taking them and all. You know what I'm saying? Jesus wants us to hear his voice, go through his gate, and follow him into the sheepfold. So it's God who sought us. Think about it like this. We don't really seek God. Before we knew Jesus, we didn't seek God. It was him seeking us. We were just responding to him seeking us. We heard him and said, I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. I, find, I, I hear God. I hear, he wants me to come to Jesus. That's what I was supposed to do the whole time. It's like, man, all I can throw out all my sheets and throw out all my diagrams and all my things. Because really, what is that when we do that? That's selfish, right? That's our flesh, our flesh wanting to kind of compensate for this need that we kind of feel like we might have, but we're not sure. But we figure if somebody ever asks us, we should probably have something written down. So it's at least we're acceptable amongst certain crowds. You know, Maybe I have a religious relative, and I need to at least say something about my religion to them. It's a selfish thing. It's not a response to Jesus. Is he alive? Yes. Does he speak? Yes. Is the Father uh, calling people to Jesus? Yes. Is the Spirit of God across the whole earth calling people into the sheepfold of Jesus? Yes, he is calling. And so as Christians, what we say is respond to the voice. Respond, not my voice, but the voice that you have already heard, which is the voice of the good shepherd telling you, come into the sheepfold where you will find rest for your souls, where you will find peace for your life, where you will no longer be stolen from and, and thieved by the enemy. Because the shepherd has a staff, and he can keep these things away from you when you trust in him. Amen? So John 10, verse 6. And this is typical. <laughs> Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. They needed the Holy Spirit, right? Because like I said, re it's revelation. But Jesus has the Spirit, so guess what? He's going to explain it to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. <laughs> Ta-da! All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. So a lot of people came before Jesus. Look at the Egyptians. How many did they have? My goodness, they had gods and goddesses and all sorts of stuff for years. The Greeks, the Romans, all those who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep, because all those represented something. Those little religious gods were demons. That's what the Bible says. They're evil spirits. Um, sheep don't listen to them. Now they blab on and on, blah, blah, blah. But the sheep don't follow them because they're not really shepherds. <laughs> they're just evil spirits. They're thieves and robbers. Jesus, like they're, they're not legitimate shepherds. They run around, say whatever they want. But, ooh, look, that, that demon spoke. Yeah, but they were like, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't even make any sense. No one's following that. There's no shepherding going on there. You see? The, these, this is why he uses these, this, is, this parable. Okay? So John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus leads us in and out, in and out, in and out to find pasture. Isn't that great? That's so good. So he's not like, here, you're in the sheepfold, you know, and you can think of one of these industrial, you know, uh, farms where everybody's in a little... It's not like that. He's like, he's letting us know even in our modern era so we can understand that the shepherd is walking out and here you are in and out to go to pastures because he's a good shepherd. So good shepherds give you good pasture because as a sheep, that's what you want. You want to eat. You know, you were like, how do you do church? Well, you feed people because <laughs> that's what people need. They need to eat. You know, I, even, even if you go, like even I, I experience the same thing. Even if you go, let's say like you go on a seminar or something for a few days and it's just a worldly seminar and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm starved. <laughs> you know, when you get to church, you're like, oh, thank you, Lord. I feel the same way. I get the, I feel up just like you guys do, just the same. It's not like everyone has to be fed by the good shepherd. So anyone who enters by me will be saved, right? So that's, again, the one way. Now. Let's look at John 10.10. 10. You guys know this one, right? John 10.10. 10. So we're, we're, we talk about the thief, right? So the thief is, doesn't do what? The thief isn't a shepherd because Jesus is the shepherd because he's the way. He's the only way, and he's the shepherd. So the thief 
does not come except to steal and to kill and to, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So what does the good shepherd give us? Life. And not just any kind of life, an abundance of life. An overflowing life. Abundance in every way of our life, in our family, in our finances, in our, our friendships, in everything. He gives us an abundance of life. Not the thief. He tries to steal, kill, and destroy. So now we see what these spirits do. They have a job. It ain't to shepherd anybody. It's to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Okay? So if there are things trying to steal, kill, and destroy in your life, you can know that that's not Jesus, right? Because it says it right there. That's the thief trying to sneak in. And he tries to sneak in. He can't get in. He has to sneak in. So once you catch him, you get the good shepherd, you kick him out. <laughs> Hit him with a staff. So now look at John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling. He who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. So now we have wolves as well as thieves coming in. And Jesus is pointing out that not everyone is interested in the sheep. So not everyone is interested in the sheep, okay? These are the part-timers, <laughs> okay? These are, here's the thing. Jesus is the good shepherd. Hirelings are in it for the money. Because he said it right there. Hirelings are in it for the money. There is natural, physical things that they want to get out of the sheep. They don't care for the sheep because it's not their sheep. It's Jesus' sheep. You see why I say, what's a pastor? A pastor is Jesus because he's the good shepherd. Any pastor is going to do whatever the good shepherd does because he's just the good shepherd. That's why Jesus has a hireling versus a shepherd. They're different. They're different things. He's pointing this out because even in his day, you had Pharisees and you had religious people and they were only interested in the physical things they could get from the sheep. They were not interested in the sheep themselves because they were only there for the money. <laughs> it's what Jesus said. A hireling is a person who is administrating sheep for physical gain. Worldly gain. <laughs> so he wants us to know the difference between these two. And with the Pharisees, he said, it's not just money. He said, you like to sit in the best places. They also like the notoriety. They like to be well thought of in the community. Those are hirelings. <laughs> and how does he know that they're hirelings? Because when things get rough, whew, off they go. Now, that doesn't mean that anybody who, if they had a rough time and they had to leave, that doesn't mean that they're a hireling. Because you can't just judge a book by the cover. You can't just look at it and say, oh, that's a hireling because they left. That doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is that there are people that are not interested in the sheep as the sheep. They're only interested in what the sheep can give them. <clears throat> Jesus said it. <laughs> so, so people, again, the sheep are valuable, very valuable. They're valuable to thieves because they can come in and they can steal them or they can just hurt them, which hurts the shepherd because they don't like the shepherd. We have hirelings who think the sheep are valuable because they're actually getting paid for watching them. <laughs> Hey, it's like babysitter sheep uh, people. Wolves think sheep are valuable because they like to eat them, <laughs> right? So, but at the end of the day, the sheep are the valuable ones. 
The sheep are the most valuable to God and to Jesus, the good shepherd. Because God doesn't even let anybody in unless you're the good shepherd. Only the good shepherd gets allowed in there. Because those sheep are valuable to God. You see why people are so important to God? And that when we start treating people like numbers and put monetary value on them and all these business concepts that come into the church, how bad that can be? Because that's like a hireling mentality. And I mean, I'm sorry that it's like that, but it is. And I'm only, you know, like, it's like, I'm like, I don't want to be the one that say that, but I am. I mean, I have to because it's true. When you start treating ministry like a business, you're starting to act like a hireling. You're starting to look at the sheep as if it's a number and another thing that you bring in to build up your empire. Well, where's the empire? It's on the earth. You're building an, an empire on the earth. And you're mixing it with a spiritual empire and trying to make the spiritual build your empire up. That's all off. And things are funky in those places. Things don't work right. Things aren't flowing in the spirit the way they should. There's not that love going back and forth in this natural spiritual move because there's other things going on that people can't see that are behind the scenes because it has to do with the hearts of men. And only God tries the hearts of men. We can't be the ones to make these evaluations. But I can tell you by the spirit not picking out any ministry in general, but by the Spirit, I can see that this happens. And it's always happened. It's happened since the early church, and it happened even before Jesus was raised from the dead because it was happening in Israel too. That's what was happening in the temple. That's what was happening with these Pharisees. These guys were in it for the money. They were in it for what the sheep could give them. <laughs> so God thinks sheep are valuable because Jesus is their shepherd, and he loves the sheep. And the sheep are his sheep. That makes a big difference. <laughs> when it's your stuff, right? You have somebody watch something for you and it's not theirs. They don't treat it the same as you would, do they? I mean, unless you pay them a lot of money, but then again, you just paid them a lot of money. They did it for the money. Sheep are God's sheep. The shepherd is Jesus. So in John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. That's the good shepherd. That's how you know that's Jesus. He gives up his life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. That was interesting, too. You didn't have to say that. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. What's Jesus saying there? He's talking about the Gentiles. <laughs> Isn't that funny? He just put that in there. And there's other, there's other sheep that are not in this. He's talking about the other. He's talking about the Gentiles because he was talking to the Jews, right? Now he's talking about, and there's other sheep. Hint, hint. He showed Peter that when he saw the sheep come down with the unclean animals in it. The other sheep are the Gentiles. John 10, 17. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. That's awesome. So we go through the door, the way, Jesus, because we are his sheep, and he is our shepherd. That's all. That's the reason why. That's why there's only one door. That's why there's only one path. That's why there's only one way. It's God manifesting his love through Jesus Christ. That's the reason why Jesus is the way. That's why he is the way, the truth, and the life. It's because of God's love. Because that's what he said right there. My father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. So isn't that awesome? So all of us as sheep in the sheepfold of God, as he is the good shepherd. So we have all of these other interests <laughs> going all around. But Jesus has told us that we will only hear his voice, the voice of another. We will not follow. We will not follow a voice that does not follow the voice of the master. So always remember that. So that's good to know. And if you're talking to people, maybe are considering you know, Christianity versus, you know, Islam versus, you know, whatever, you know, you can tell them about how it's God intervening in our lives and that we, we can talk to God 
and listen to him, and he will tell us the truth. A lot of people in foreign countries, like in Iran, Pakistan, we've heard these stories where people would be um, asleep, and they would have dreams, and Jesus would come to them in their dreams and tell them, it's me, Jesus, believe in me. He would appear to them in the dreams, and these people would become saved, and nobody ever preached them. Jesus himself appeared to them. It happens. As a matter of fact, it happens so. It happens so much in some countries. They actually had a word for it. Um, there was a certain word they categorized, and they and even the um, the religious leaders, the ones that run the mosques and stuff, many of them have seen Jesus. Many of them. So, what the world is painting, the picture it's painting about the conflicts that are going on, that's not the real conflict, and there isn't really a conflict when it comes to the to the new creation, because that conflict is already over and Jesus won it. So we do have some writhing going around, but in the end, you know, Jesus has already paid the price. You know, so people are hearing his voice all over the world, and they are coming into the kingdom of God. So it's good. Well, that's what I had for today, everybody. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you just for showing us some new aspects and new things about our life in you. And Lord, we just ask that as we hear this word today, that it would go down, the good things would go down to the good parts of our heart and grow, and, and your word would just develop even stronger in us every day. So we thank you, Father, that you are good, that Jesus is the good shepherd, and he lays down his life for us. And so, Father, we thank you that we can follow him in and out of the sheepfold, and he leads us into green pastures, and he leads us into good things. In Jesus' name, amen.